morning. We'll be starting this morning in Ezekiel chapter 36, entering into a controversial part of Ezekiel. Uh, chapter 37 includes the dry bones prophecy. And this section talks about a lot about the millennial kingdom, which is a controversial topic all on its own. Hopefully you enjoy our, our discussion today, and thanks again for joining us. Have a blessed rest of your day. All right, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for a place to meet. Uh, we thank you for your word, that we can meet around your word and talk about your word. Your word, you placed your word above yourself. And Lord, as we study your word, we get to know you more intimately. Uh, see not just uh, what you've done as a history, but who we, we get more information and depth of who you are, how you react to things, how you how you look at things. Because your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And Lord, as we study the Old Testament and the New Testament, but specifically today the Old Testament, we get to get a clear picture of who you are because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be with us today, Holy Spirit of God. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today so that we might learn more of you and get to know you more intimately. And Lord, give, give us the uh, heart of David to be able to share your word with others who are seeking and are, some are perishing for lack of knowledge. Pray in Jesus' name. All right, so Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, we'll look at big section here. <clears throat> we'll go around the room. We'll start with you reading. Uh, if you'd read verses 1 through 7. Who, Scott? Bill. Okay. Can you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy said of you, Ah, and the ancient heights have become our passion, our possession. Therefore, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, precisely because they made you desolate and crushed you from all sides so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and you became the talk of the evil gossip of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills of the hills, the ravine and the valleys, the desolate waste and the deserted cities, which have become a prey and desertion to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I have spoken in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all at Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and utter contempt that they might make its pasture lands a prey. Therefore, prophecy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys, thus says the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealous wrath because you have suffered the reproach of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I swear that the nations that are all around you shall themselves suffer reproach. It's interesting now, of course, we've been going through Ezekiel, and he's been uh, prophesying to the people, warning them of the impending doom. Um, but we forget the earth itself, back in Genesis, we're told the earth itself is under a curse. So God is speaking now to the land, uh, the land didn't do anything wrong. I mean, the land's under the curse because of what man did, not because of what it did. So the, the surrounding nations, as you recall, we've talked about this several times, were coming in and just gobbling up the land, taking possession, stripping the land of everything, uh, just uh, doing what they will with it. And God's speaking out against them and saying, no, this is my land. Uh, it's, it's the promised land. 
even though my people are right now under my wrath and jealousy, as we'll see as we get later in, in Ezekiel, uh, that's going to change. But God is now saying that he is speaking a curse on the surrounding nations that have taken advantage of his, it's his land. It's not our land, it's his land. And God will, the nations that are around about you shall themselves suffer shame and reproach. Again, the nations that have harmed Israel, even though they did so at God's bidding with his permission, shall themselves be judged. God's talking to the land. He's also talking through the land to the surrounding nations. Um, and I, I think, I, I made a note here on a personal level. I think also about our time and others' time for testing when God allows circumstances and our, or people to cause distress. God calls on us to look up and not around. We look to the Lord. When others have times of testing, God calls on us to react in love and not in judgment. Because the same type of curse that goes on the people that are attacking his land and his people, guess what? As Christians, we are his people. We are his chosen people. We are the people written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation, slain from the foundation of the world, so that people who come against us and who come against us in a bad way will themselves reap God's vengeance and God's wrath. So <clears throat> we need to be careful when other people are suffering, be it physical illness or stress or mental stress or a time of testing, we need to make sure that we're reacting in love and not out of vengeance. So again, God wants us to support each other as the body of Christ. So, and as if we don't do it that way, if we don't react in that way, then we are bringing God's judgment on ourselves. That's kind of important to remember. Because at one time or another, all of us are under some type of testing. <coughs> illness or whatever it might be. God uses everything to bring us all into line wherever we need to be. But that doesn't mean that we surround people like a pack of wolves. They said that I've heard before the church and the Republican Party the only two things that have a circular firing squad. You know? yeah. We get against each other and we shoot each other instead mm -hmm. of lifting each other up. So we need to make sure that we're lifting each other up and doing it in love. Uh I'm reminded of Matthew 7, 3. Why do you stare from without at the very small particle that is your brother's eye do not become aware of and consider the beam of timber, I call it railroad tie, in your own eye? And somebody gave me a different perspective on that the other day. When you have a speck in your eye, if you, can, if you look around and try to look for it with your eye, and you find it, it looks like a huge beam. Well, if you can't find that, then don't worry about your brother's speck in his eye. Worry about your own. But ain't that the same thing that Jesus was talking about in um, Romans chapter 2? Um, it was Paul about talking about Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. I mean Paul. Okay. I meant to say Paul. Okay. We'll say, talk about the same thing as the church leaders and everything and how we're okay. always pointing fingers. and I mean, back the same stuff that they were doing Back then, we are still doing to our brothers and sisters yeah. today. Yep. Instead of, we all supposed to be serving the same God. And, yeah. we, and you know, the whole thing is to glorify God, not ourselves. Correct. So we get off track when we try to do things in our own church instead of relying on God, God and to work together to bring glory to God. I think here, I agree. But I think here, God's calling on us individually, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, calling us on us individually to speak out of love and not yeah. out of anger or hate. Mm -hmm. And that's that's very hard to so do. There's an issue of compassion as well. Because when you talk about a speck, a speck hurts. Yes, it does. Time. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. You don't need a piece of wood. If every little speck is killing you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you, you realize that what other people are going through why they're reacting the way, why they're acting. They may be having problems in their life. Right? That's true. And sometimes true. hurt people hurt people. Yes, they do. And people that are hurting reach out and hurt. You're right. They do. Go ahead. 
And just, just on that, I was just thinking this morning, I don't know why it came to mind about something I believe was C.S. Lewis said, and I, I think it applies because when we're in the church, we're like, well, this, this person's a fellow Christian. But we forget, and I, I love the old saying, the church is not a museum for pristine saints. It's a hospital ward for broken sinners. Well, amen. And, I mean, rightly so, we should expect a Christian reaction in the church, but we got to remember who fills the church, human beings. You know, they're... We're going to screw up, no matter how good our intent. That's what it all comes down to. We're going to screw up. We're going to make mistakes. It's it doesn't make it any easier at the time, but no. looking back, the Bible admonishes us to walk in the spirit. So we don't have the desire of the flesh. You know? Exactly. So as we deal with other people, we're called on to do that. You know? That adult, it's a worn out phrase. WWJD? What would Jesus do? But that's what we have to do. How we have to react to our Lord and pray. Because we're his hand and his feet for now. He's coming back soon, but uh, while he's not here, we're his representatives. And how good a representative are we, by the way, we react to other people who have problems. We'll move on. Um, we have a promise of reversal. Mary, if you'd read verses 8 and 9 of chapter 36. But you, O mountain of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. Mm. Where am I going to? God's promising that the judgment, not only on the land, but on his mm. people, will be reversed. Now, the word soon, I see the word soon here. Now, if you recall, the Ezekiel, remember, is in Babylon during the captivity. He's prophesying from there. God is speaking to him through there. As he's speaking, the Jews are still in captivity. And after 70 years of captivity, they're going to be allowed to go back to their land. And history tells us, and the Bible tells us, there only a small remnant went back. A lot more people stayed than went back to, to, to the promised land. They were comfortable in Babylon. That speaks of that's that's not a whole sermon. But God is reminding us that there will be a time when you sh the land will be tilled and sown, the land will be blessed again. And that's coming. And again, the words we see soon in the Bible, a thousand years is as a day to the Lord. So Maybe he says tomorrow or a couple days, you know, but uh, that's still a long time when it be full. The curse will be fully reversed. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. Going around the room on the, on the screen. Mike, it's your turn. If you read verses 10 and 11 of chapter 36. And I will multiply people on you, the whole house of Israel, all of it. The cities shall be inhabited in the waste. Uh, places rebuilt, and I will multiply beast. And they shall multiply. I will cause you to be inhabited as in your times, and do a more good to you than ever before. Then you will know that I'm Lord. We got a promise, a future promise that this will all be made right. Now, if you come back to what we just talked about. The 70, after 70 years of captivity, they're sent back to the land. Um, we know that the land was never as prosperous as it was before. There wasn't as many people, even though God made them multiply and so on. But this promise to this day still hasn't fully been fulfilled. Um, I will multiply upon you, man and beast, increase and be fruitful, and cause you to be inhabited according to your former estate. And I will do better for you than at your beginnings. And you shall know and understand and realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler, who calls forth loyalty and obedient service. And again, we're looking forward to a future time now. If you want to get into um, promises from God, I mean, eventually, when we have a new heaven and a new earth, Jerusalem is still going to be the capital. Jerusalem is the holy city of God, Zion. It's something God always talks about. He loved, always loved Jerusalem, um, which is why he was so jealous for 
his people and for the city itself that this promise won't be fulfilled until in the future, way in the future, and when Christ returns and rules the earth. And that this is a, again, most biblical scholars, not all, because you put 100 biblical scholars in the room, everybody's going to have a little different opinion, like economists, you know. But anyway, um, we're, most scholars agree we're kind of talking here through, through this about the promise of the millennial kingdom, when Christ shall rule and reign on earth with his saints. And remember, not all Israel is Israel, but we are, as grafted in children of God, we're part of Israel. We're adopted Israelites. Um, we don't have the bloodline, but we have the pedigree from our Lord Christ that we are Israel. All right. Thank you, Bill or Mike and Mary. Uh, next we go to Al. Al, could you read verses 12 and 13? Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be thy inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. Thus saith the Lord God, because they say unto you, Thou land devourest up men, and hast bereaved thy nations. Interesting. And, and again, and, and the Amplified says, Bereave your nation of children. And the Amplified states, in, in the brackets, which means it's not a Hebrew translation, it was the interpreter's interpretation of that particular passage. In both places where it says, bereaves them of children, they're talking, the Amplified says, for idol sacrifices. Um, when John Gill, who might want to uh, says that passage is really referring to uh, women suffering miscarriages because they're falling. Are natural calamities causing women to have miscarriages. So you can look at it two ways. Uh, the land, again, land is where they built the altars. Can't really blame the land, blame the people. But the land uh, is bereaving them of children either through idol sacrifices or because women are falling and, and, and uh, losing their children because of uh, miscarriages. Just an interesting insight, two different ways of looking at that same passage. Okay, around the room, um, verse 14 and 15, Katrina. Okay. Therefore you shall devour men no more, nor bereave your nations anymore, says the Lord God. Nor will I let you hear the toss of the nations anymore, nor bear reproach of the people anymore, nor shall you cause your nations to stumble anymore, says the Lord God. Okay. So now, and again, this is a, a good case, <clears throat> excuse me, reading this is a good case to say this didn't happen when they returned to Israel. Remember, if you remember your Nehemiah and your Ezra, the books in the Bible, when we studied them, Nehemiah was uh, constantly having to worry about the surrounding nations, having to worry about the Jews intermarrying with the surrounding nations. It was not, this This prophecy was not fulfilled when they returned from their Babylonian captivity. This will be fulfilled in the future, not being re, not being done now. Uh, or in the near future, it's a future prophecy. <coughs> Verses 16 through 20, uh, we're going to find out why God took them out of land again. Joe? <coughs> The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they shed in the land for their idols, with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judge them. But when they come to the nations, wherever they ca came to the nations, wherever they came, they profane my holy name, and that people said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. So again, God's detailing all the bad things that Israel did, uh, idolatry, sacrifice, and child sacrifice, human sacrifice. 
which is never a part of God's plan ever. We don't read anywhere in the Bible where it says, sacrifice your children to me. He did say the firstborn belongs to me. And instead of a human sacrifice, if you recall, in the, in the Jewish law, if you had a, a, a male child, your firstborn was a male child, you had to take a sacrifice to the temple. Joseph and Mary were taking a sacrifice to the temple when they met Anna uh, and Simeon. So uh, that, that should be, bring back some memory. But God didn't require you to kill your, kill your baby. He required you to have a sacrifice because the firstborn always belonged to the Lord. He, he required that. That was his, his heritage through you. Um, <clears throat> So many times we forget uh, that uh, God is God has uh, shown us the things that He has done. He's shown the nation Israel what He's done, and reminds us of why He is who He is and what He expects of us. And this, then this wrath or this description of His wrath on Israel. It's just another reminder of that. I'm going to get into another things that God does not take us out of our comfort zone. Keith, if you if you read verses 21 to 23. I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned, profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. My holiness, and the Antelite says, when I shall be set apart by you and my holiness vindicated in you before their eyes and yours. Fascinating. Um, so many times I forget that God does everything not for my comfort, but for his glory. And here God is saying to the Jews, I'm not doing this because you are extra good. I'm not doing this because I want you to uh, be happy. I'm doing all this. The, Reclamation, the returning to the land, the blessings are because my name is holy. I have called you out as my people, and I'm going to demonstrate through what happens to you that, <clears throat> that I, in fact, am holy, and I can bless you, and I'm in charge. God's in charge. Uh, not uh, and Remember, all the surrounding nations were worshiping Baal. Um, the surrounding nations today are worshiping the euro or the dollar or the the yuan or the uh, whatever other type of currency they're worshiping uh, instead of worshiping the true God. But God remember God's reminding us that He does this for His name's sake. Because God will not share His glory with another, and God will always glorify His name. And He's going to He promises to do that through the blessing of the nation Israel. And by Israel, he means Israel and the church, if you will. I'm going to read verses 24 to 27. And this is a, a, a real fascinating portion of scripture. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put in you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall heed my ordinances and do them. Can anyone argue that today we've taught now that we've repeated this, this is a repeat performance from Ezekiel eleven nineteen. But can we anyone argue today that the church as it is is a full fulfillment, a full fulfillment, a complete fulfillment of this prophecy? 
Anyone see that happening? I mean, a not just a, um, I'm not talking about, okay, the Holy Spirit is with us. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is filling you. But are we completely walking in his statutes today? No. No, we're, we're not. So this, the stony heart, and give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit in you and cause you, cause you to walk in my statutes. That's not happening yet. God's spirit is with us and in us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the spirit lives in you and it helps us. We, I will send you the helper. Jesus called him a helper. He didn't call him. It was not a final fulfillment of this prophecy. But the fulfillment of the prophecy will occur. But it hasn't happened yet. So we can't say, well, the church is the expression of this. So it's a, a foretaste. I mean, we're looking in the mirror. We're not seeing the real image yet. It's coming. God promises that it will come. He will sprinkle us with clean water. And that's, that's a reference to baptism. Remember, even the ancient Israelites used baptism. And in the time of Jesus, before Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist was baptizing people. The Jewish, the temple had a baptism that they could do upon you. Um, the, the Pharisees messed it up by their, their laws and what they did with it. We've talked about that. But again, the full, the complete fulfillment of this is still coming in the future. So it's a look into the future of what will happen. Um, we're still subject, like we are, we are still subject to sin, and we do sin. Thank God we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous, that helps us and forgives us of our sin. Even though we're saved, we still sin. So it's not, we're, we don't have a perfect, perfect fulfillment of this yet. It's the best way to put it. Okay. Um, going around the room. Bill, it's your turn again. You'd read verses 28. To uh, 32. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant, and lay to famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that <clears throat> were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not, it is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God, let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. And the Amplified says, Be ashamed and confounded for your wicked ways, O house of Israel. And if we remember, <clears throat> the return to Israel was not the return of the, the captives from Babylon when it happened. It wasn't pretty. It was... They went back into the land, and that was a miracle that they were allowed to go back into the land. It was a genuine miracle from God, speaking through Darius, through the, the, the king of the Persian Empire. But that being said, they still suffered famine. They still suffered uh, other problems. So this, again, <clears throat> is speaking of something in the future. And it, what remind, when, I re, when I read this, it reminded me that they're going to, when the end times come, they're going to remember that they are the ones responsible, along with the Romans, for killing the Lord, killing the Son of God. That They're going to see that. And they're going to weep as they weep for an only child or a firstborn son, meaning that they were sorry, would be sorry for killing Jesus. They're going to realize that they killed the Son of God, and they're going to be... A, a shame and a reproach, and they're going to weep for what they did. That's part of this weeping here that we're seeing here. But the weeping for the Son of God comes later. And we, we get that, again, New Testament gives us a little more insight into the Old Testament. 
where we understand that the weeping is not just for what they did, but for, for their deeds, just regular sin, turning away from God, worshiping idols, but it's for crucifying the only son of God that God sent to them. So, um, again, prophecy, future tense, no more famine, uh, fruit of the tree, increase of the field. It's going to, to uh, disgrace among the nations all white power. Again, a future time. Next, uh, let's look at verses 33 to 36, Mary. <coughs> Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all of your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places shall be rebuilt. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being a desolation, that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, this land that was desolated has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and the desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolated. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. Scientists agree in the present, here and now, physical, that the land, the ground in Israel is fertile. And Israel is, is, uh, has a big desalinization project to irrigate land. But they're only irrigating a small portion of their land. But the land that they're giving water to is just bringing forth crops, oranges, and all kinds of things. That are growing in that land. It's phenomenal. Well, and, and the day that God blesses that land, it's going to be, it's going to make what they're doing today look like a walk, a, a nothing, you know, something very tiny, because it will be more general. God promises that that land will be blessed again. They will receive rain as opposed to, or receive moisture as opposed to what's happening now, which is still under a curse. It's still desolate. Uh, if you go to Israel, there's, there's one thing it can grow, most of the land that grows really well, is rocks. I mean, lots of rocks. It's pretty, pretty big. But God does promise to make Israel a place better than before. It's interesting to me that God brings up Eden. Um, they shall say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And, of course, Eden, uh, that reference goes back to a time before the curse. So the curse will be reversed. That's why, again, we, I'm looking at this as more of a prophecy of the coming millennial kingdom when God, when Jesus will be ruling the earth and the curse on the land will be reversed and God will bless it again. Next, Mike, if you read verse 37 and 38. Thus says the Lord God, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, increase their people like, like the flock for like the flock at Jerusalem for appointed feast. So shall the waste cities be filled with oxen. Then they will know that I am the Lord. You are breaking up really bad, Mike. I'm going to read it again. Thus right. says the Lord God, for this also I will let the house of Israel inquire of me and do it for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like the flock of holy things for sacrifice, like the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn appointed feasts. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know and understand and realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler who calls forth loyalty and obedient service. The Bible states over and over that children are a blessing from God. That's not the way we're treating them here in this country now, unfortunately. Um, but children are a blessing. Scholars, if you read, some of the modern scholars are saying that during the thousand-year reign of Christ, that part of the curse, you remember back, you remember your Genesis? Part of the curse is that women, when they have children, go through a lot of pain. We guys may stand there with you and 
help you with your breathing exercises. But you girls are going through the, the all the uh, the fun stuff, the really the pain. It's very painful. Well, part of the reversal of the curse in the millennial kingdom will be that childbirth is no longer painful. It's that that curse is reversed. Okay, so that and children will be born like great will be a big multiplication of of the earth will be filled and with jesus ruling and reigning the earth the curse has been removed from the earth the, everything's growing while people are eating there's no more famine there's no more pestilence that the, the world itself is in a perfected state that people will be um, having a lot of kids because they can feed them all and they can eat themselves not a problem um the population of the world is predicted by many scholars who believe in the millennial kingdom that uh, the population of Earth will totally explode and be a bigger number of people than ever than we have today. And this is after the the tribulation period where the Earth is decimated. So just fascinating, fascinating time and what we're going through. Okay, we're coming up on now. We move on to verse thirty-seven. Hmm. Al, if you'd be so kind as to read uh, verses 1 through 3. Was that me? Yeah, that was you, Al. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And so up until now, verse chapter 36, God is speaking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is prophesying based on what God is telling him to say. Okay? So now we got to move on to something new, similar to what happened to John in the book of Red, the, to the revelation of, of Jesus Christ through John where he's taken in the spirit someplace. And God has come upon him, brought him out in the spirit of the Lord, and set him down in the midst of a valley. And it was full of dry bones. Um, and he had, again, just fascinating that God is doing this and again, showing him something different, something new, to, to bring everything that he's talking about home to him. Um. Now, if I, in the notes that I'm going to send out when we're done with this today, I encourage you to read the notes from John Gill on chapter 37, verse 1. It's half a page. It's really interesting when you get into um, uh, the information and things behind the thoughts behind this passage. He really gets some really good insight into this whole section of Scripture. But again, it's Again, we're in the middle of a valley of dry bones, and he asks, can these bones live again? And if it were you or me, I'd say, well, Lord, you you, you could be able to do this. I can't do a thing about this. This is all you, not me. So let's, talk, let's, let's do something with these dry bones. Katrina, you're next. Would you read verses 4 through 8? <clears throat> and again, he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall, li you shall live. And I will swine on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put and put breath in you and you shall live then you shall know that I am I am the Lord God so I prophesy as I commanded and as a prophecy there was a noise and suddenly a rattle and the bones came together bone to bone indeed as I looked the swine the flesh came upon the, sinews. Huh? Sinews. Sinews. Yeah, no swine. okay upon them and the skin covered over them but there was no breath in them okay so go back to genesis god creates adam out of the dirt he creates the body okay and there's no life in it yet 
but there's a body created. Here God is taking dead men's bones, putting them back together. The bones are now fully formed. The flesh is over them. They're laying there, but they're dead. They're, they're, they're just dead bodies. Instead of all dry bones, these are now dead bodies. So the next thing God does is make them come alive, like he did in Genesis. Go to read verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Remember, we're told in Genesis, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Some translations translate it as the breath of lives. But God breathed into that, the, the flesh of Adam, the breath of life. Here, God gives life to these formerly dead bodies that were given flesh. Now God gives them life. So they are, in fact, alive again. Keith, you read verses 11 through 14. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle in your own land. Then you will know that I am. The Lord has spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is, again, fascinating section here. In a physical sense, this will happen at the resurrection of the just. Um, they will inhabit the kingdom. We do have to remember that not all Israel is Israel. So the ones that are resurrected at this time are going to be the ones that are in Christ, if you will, that have faith in God, that have... Uh, faith was counted to them for righteousness. Um, and then remember also that he's speaking to Israel, but he's also speaking not just to Israel, but to the adopted Israelites. We're adopted Israelite, Israelites, okay? We are adopted Jews, adopted into God's family because of what Jesus did on the cross. The Lord himself said, I have sheep that are not of this fold. That would be us. So again, he's prophesying, he's talking to the Jews now, Ezekiel is, but remember, God is not just talking to the Jews, he's talking to us, and we will be resurrected again. We will have a new body, and I can't wait. This one's getting worn out fast. And when we're resurrected in this way, we will have it the land. It's just exciting times, and exciting to think about that God is promising this, and this will happen. And he is he, the Lord. Our Son. Lord says, he will do it. Yes, he will. No matter, we can't fathom how that's going to happen. No. You know, I mean, sometimes I even think about when people get cremated and they're all over the, the cosmos, they're right. dust and everything. Yes. How is he going to do all that? Oh, yeah. He's gonna, they're at the bottom of the sea. He's going to pull them together. That's amazing. This, and, well, and, and Revelation talks about the sea moving up its head and I don't know, and so on. Yes, absolutely. It is amazing. Now, go back to ancient Israel. Just a little, real tiny side note. If you're a Jew, you believe that there's a bone somewhere, even if you, even if you um, pre get cremated, there is a bone in your body that never disintegrates, that never, that, that the part of you that never goes away, supposedly. And that, from, from that little piece of bone, God resurrects your body. That's why most Jews hate um, uh, cremation. They want to be cremated because they figure the Orthodox Jew believes that there's a bone that never disintegrates that will be part of the, that God will recreate you out of that little piece of bone. Okay, I'm just telling, I'm just bearing the story. It's true. Um, so, again, fascinating. Um, 
we will live again. That, that time is coming when we will live again. Now we're getting into a little bit more of an interesting topic here. I'm going to read uh, verses 15 through 19. Chapter 37 of Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take a stick and write on it for Judah and the children of Israel, his companions. And take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, all the house of Israel, his companions. Join them together into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. And when your people say to you, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim. And the tribes of Israel, his associates, will join it with the stick of Judah, make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. Again, fascinating time. Israel will again be Israel. You won't have two kingdoms split. The curse that came upon them from when Solomon abandoned God, worshipped other gods. He said that the kingdom will be torn out of your hand. Nevertheless, for the sake of my servant David, your, your, your prodigy, your child will have part of the land. You will have part of the kingdom. And in my opinion, the best part, because they had Jerusalem. Uh, it's a time when uh, they will come back together again. So God is prophesying, I will bring you back to being one nation again. Uh, and again, not for uh, what he has done or what we have done, but for what he has done for us. So fascinating times. Uh, God, and, and we remember our Old Testament, even though there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, the northern kingdom was was bad first, but the southern kingdom went, went into captivity. It was a hundred or so years later, maybe a little more than years later, they went into captivity and they fell away. But God has always looked at Israel as Israel, one, one people, one land. No comments? Any any comments on that? All quiet. Okay. Um, Bill, we'll go back to you if you would. If you would read verses 20 through 23. 20, 20. When the stick, when the stick when, sound, I'm getting an echo. Can you hear it? No, I can't hear an echo here. Okay. When the sticks on which you write are in your hand before their eyes, then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone and will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over all of them, and they shall be no longer two nations and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not be, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and their detestable, detestable things or with any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all their backslinging in which they have sinned and will cleanse them and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. This simple promise to Israel isn't so simple when we think in terms of when this will take place. Many say it will be in the thousand-year reign of Christ, as in Revelation 20 and Isaiah 11. Others look for it to take place later in the kingdom of God. But again, they come back, uh, I will be their people, they will be my people, I will be their God, um, they will be back in the land, uh, make them one land all over again. On the mountains of Israel, king shall be king over them all, and shall no longer be two nations, nor, nor divided into two kingdoms anymore, uh, no longer idolater, no longer worshiping idols. Uh, but again, God's promising this to happen in the future. And then we will finish chapter 37. Mary, if you'd read verses 24 through 28. 
My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my stat status. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers live. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever, and David my servant shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. I shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, mm. sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Get a fascinating look. <clears throat> um, now we know that in the thousand year kingdom that Jesus Christ will rule with a rod of iron. And Jesus Christ will be the ruler. So then what? how can David rule in the kingdom? I mean, he's talking here. He didn't say a descendant of my servant David. He says, "My servant David, my servant, shall be king over them." Any any thoughts on how that can work? David's throne too. David's throne is Jesus has the right to be on David's throne. Maybe that's what they're referring to. It can't be a literal thing. It's a conference. Okay. And and when we're understanding, Jesus is going to reign. Right. It'll be rule reign of Christ. Yeah. Right. Mike, any thoughts on your part? Yeah, I think I'm only getting every other word from you guys, and I'm sure I'm breaking up, so I've just been kind of quiet. Sorry. It's okay. I don't know what's going on with this thing, but that functions quite right. All right. But, and again, my, my question was uh, verses 30, I'm sorry, verses 24 to 28. Talk about literally David, my servant, shall be king over them. Um, how could that be possible? Yeah, it's uh, easy to see why somebody in, in Jesus' time would be expecting David to come back. Yes, that's right. Um, having read this, you would certainly assume, um, and of course you'd be wrong. So. Now your I mean, favorite book series, Mark. Your favorite book series, the Left Behind series? The fiction book, you mean? That fiction one? book. <laughs> that, the way that LaHaye treats this, Tim LaHaye treats this like, okay, David's going to be literally, he'll be, he'll be the subordinate of Christ. He'll be in charge, but doing the bidding of Christ. That, that's the way he treats it. And what scripture did he use to come up with that? I, God only knows. Uh -huh. But that's the way they treated in the books. Um, having read the books, I know that. So, um, again, we're talking here, my servant David. And remember, Jesus is the fulfillment of uh, God promised David there will always be somebody uh, from your prodigy, from your children, will rule Israel. Someone will always be there, and that someone is the the, the pre-incarnate and then the incarnate Christ, who has David's seed in him, if you will, and that promise is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus will rule and reign, and will rule over Israel. Now it's interesting to me talking about when I read this, um, and they shall dwell there, they and their children and their children's children forever. So. We're told by Jesus that they're in heaven in the final time that people are need, neither married nor given in marriage in the kingdom of God. So how can that be? What what are we what are we thinking? What are they thinking of here? <coughs> Again, I, I the way I look at that scripture is. They're talking about 
of the millennial kingdom. There will be uh, literally children will be born during the, the millennial period and their children and their children's children. The word forever, I have a problem with, though, because the millennial kingdom ends after a thousand years. When Satan is loosed from the pit, from being bound for a thousand years, it comes back and, and uh, leads the people that don't believe in Jesus, that are living in the kingdom at that time, in rebellion against God, and they are put down with one word, and they're, they're destroyed. So the forever part, I have a problem with the chil their children's children. There will be a cutoff. There has to be a cutoff period sometime because in heaven, in the final, or the final expression of God's eternal reward, there is no marriage or giving in marriage. So there's no more kids born after that. Natural. Yes. Other than unless God creates them. That's my point. Yeah. That we just don't know. We don't. We really don't. But we don't. You're right. Can God create another hundred million angels? Of course, He could he create a hundred million people. I have a word. Of course, he was capable of all of that. Fascinating. We're going to cut off there. It's almost seven o'clock, so we'll cut off there today. First, chapter thirty-seven. Next week, we'll begin in chapter thirty-eight. We get into the whole end times Gog and Magog thing, which is another fascinating part of the Book of Ezekiel. So, more prophecy uh, of, of the time when that is coming that. Where a, a nation will be, we're talking again about putting a hook in your jaw, like we talked about with Egypt before. Another hook in your jaw moment when God will force someone to do something, but they're going to want to do it. It's fascinating. God works in mysterious ways, His wonders to perform. And we'll get a, a perfect view of all of this when we're with Jesus. We'll have a perfected view of it all. Close with a word of prayer. Um, Philip, would you do the time with a word of prayer today, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, study your word. We thank you for all those um, who will listen to this um, message from you, Lord. I pray for um, continued learning that we can um, learn about your word, Lord. Please, Amen. please. Um, Bless all those who attend and all those that listen. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right-hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash KNOXEPC. Find past sermons on our website noxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at noxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at noxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on Giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.